I'm going to make a confession. I started my career, as Michelle mentioned, um, over 30 years ago, and I was drinking the Kool-Aid. I was uh, teaching this new course to me. I'd, I'd done my studies in paleoclimatology and uh, quaternary uh, climates. And so I was teaching a course called Quaternary Geology. And I changed the course title to Quaternary Geology and Climate Change because it was the thing. We were all learning about this. CO2 was rising. And one of the uh, major venues for information on this was the American Geophysical Union. And their uh, monthly newspaper featured science that was showing that CO2 is warming the ice shelves around Antarctica and melting the Greenland ice sheet and changing our world. And so, of course, I'm going to promote this and, and talk. A colleague of mine, uh, about a decade later, he approached me. He says, Ian, you know, I've got to talk to you about this. He'd been doing research on climate change over the last 600 million years. Yeah, and Weiser. He was drilling down in the science, and he made me aware that there was more to it than CO2 as the driver. And water vapor. I learned about this. So I started drilling down on this, started learning more about it. And I became aware that, yes, this whole CO2 uh, monologue, really, was uh, a house of cards. It was based on very poor science. There was holes in it. There was alternate points of view. And so many of my colleagues were, were missing this. So I started to look more closely at it, and I became a convert. And I felt I should speak out at that point, and, uh, and I've never looked back. And every time I look at the data again, I see new data. It's only reinforcing my, and I think our, many of us here, our view that uh, CO2 is really not, it doesn't carry the role in climate that people attribute it to. So what sh should we be worried about? So I thought tonight I would talk about a reality check on climate. And more recently now, with net zero, this has to be addressed. Because we really are faced with the daily news that we're facing a global climate crisis. We have to re reduce our emissions to net zero by uh, 2050. That's a challenge, a huge challenge. And everybody overlooks the fact that CO2 really is the essence of life. So I'm not teaching anything to you, but it bears repeating that we're talking about something which is not a pollutant. It's not a contaminant, although the EPA has declared it such. It's good for us. It's essential. So uh, a reality check on climate and net zero. I want to pose three questions to look at tonight. Is the climate changing? Has it changed in the past? Is it changing now? Is CO2 driving? What do we know about CO2 as a driver? And can we achieve net zero? So everybody knows that the big rock down in Okotoks didn't get here on its own. It was carried by ice sheets. And so this is perhaps one of the most dramatic evidence of uh, global climate change when we had ice sheets here. But everybody knows that that's not news. The Okotoks big rock was carried out of the Rockies by the, uh, the mountain ice sheet when it collided with the Laurentide ice sheet and deposited there in the plains uh, some 20,000 years ago. But the Ice Ages was back then. What about the stable Holocene climate that we've been enjoying and that civilization has flourished during? Well, when we start to look at ice core records and a number of proxy records, so we, we have cyclicity in the climate, and this has been demonstrated. The, the Holocene Hipsy Thermal, these were major events when the Arctic was free of ice. And then more recently, the medieval warm period that people know about, very contestable weather was even warmer then than it is today with the warming that we've, uh, we've uh, seen. Uh, very important and not necessarily within living memory anymore, but we had the Little Ice Age, which endured up to the 1900s and was uh, a period of, of great challenge in Europe. And we have all sorts of evidence for the Little Ice Age here in Canada where our glaciers spread down onto the plains up in Baffin Island. I was hiking up there, and the glaciers up on the walls of the mountains used to come down. They formed these huge moraines that we had to hike around. So it was an impactful event, real data to show this. 
And of course, we've got uh, recent uh, warming period. If we look closely at that, these are the uh, global measured surface temperatures. This is by the Hadley Climate Research Unit. And uh, there is, theirs is perhaps the most uh, commonly used. Uh, some will argue some unreliability in it because of the temperature data sets they choose to use, the, the thermometers and, and so on. Some are corrupted with urbanization. Nonetheless, it's kind of the, the most common and best we have. And we see that we have warmed. These are measured temperatures about a degree since the turn of the last century up to today. It hasn't been uh, straight and uniform. We've had very warm period in the 30s and 40s and then up to today. The oceans have warmed as well. And the oceans is perhaps one of the overlooked elements in global warming because the heat capacity of the ocean exceeds that of the atmosphere by uh, many tens of thousands. And so there's a tremendous amount of energy held within the ocean. And those temperatures tell us that you know, here we are in the Little Ice Age, and it's warm. Great. We've seen a lot of development of agriculture and improvement in uh, uh, quality of life because it's warmer than it was during the Little Ice Age. Satellite measurements began in 1979. And while controversial, it is perhaps the best record of climate warming because these are tropospheric temperatures. These are the lower atmosphere uh, record I'm showing here by uh, the, the uh, University of Al Alabama at Huntsville, uh, their, their temperature record. And uh, we see that since the onset of satellite records, uh, we've warmed. And we've got a period in here, I would say, since about 1998, when the overall trend is, is upward. And so, yes, the climate has changed. Simple answer. Uh, however, I think what we can talk about are extreme events, because these are what are used to, to underline the danger, the climate hysteria, is that we're faced with now unprecedented climate events, weather events. Uh, and every title seems to invoke um, climate change. So how hurricanes are, are uh, impacted by climate change. And if we look at the records, we see that uh, what we have today is not unusual, not anomalous. These are total hurricanes since 1945 there, uh, up to, uh, the, the, I guess, is that 2020, I think? 2019, and then major hurricanes. We don't have any increasing trends. So even the IPCC, if you dig down in their literature, they themselves suggest, despite what we hear on, this, on the news, that uh, hurricanes aren't increasing in strength. But they don't, they don't trumpet that. Here's a Colorado State University's record, similar evidence. It's, it's very static, uh, very erratic, I should say but not, a, not an upward trend, nothing to worry about. We just have to live with hurricanes. Drought, always attributed, uh, you know, climate change, climate warming is gonna bring more drought, more chaos in, for agriculture, and of course, we have this. And uh, if we look at the trends, this is a, uh, a, a, the uh, different severities of, of drought, but if we look at the most severe index, by this organization who tracks this globally. So this is the fraction of global land in drought at any given time. Uh, you know, for the last 40 years, no trend. And statistically, we can, if there's anything, there's a downward trend for some of these. We have perhaps a wetter earth, I don't know, but drought is not an issue. Uh, the heat dome is something that I didn't suffer. I was in Ontario. But BC and, and you people certainly did out here, and uh, a terrible thing. Uh, Europe had one as well. But if we go back in time, people have suffered heat, intense, intense heat uh, domes uh, in the past as well. So whether ours was worse this past, uh, I, I'm not too sure, but it's not unprecedented. And forest fires is something, of course, is on everybody's mind. <clears throat> and the IPCC is very silent on forest fires as well. But 
Uh, the media is not. And the media will tell us that this, every time there's any uh, uh, discussion of forest fires and wildfires, it's related to climate change. But we don't see a change over time. We don't see a trend over time until we hit, of course, this year. And uh, when we, here's two other records. This is for the Canadian record of areas burned versus number of fires, a downward trend for the number of fires. Uh, areas burned, chaotic, but no trend. Of course, until we get to 2023. In science, we don't call this a trend, we call this an anomaly. I'm not a forester, I don't understand. Perhaps there's people in the audience who know better what could explain what happened this year. But we can't call that a trend. And then, of course, Calgary suffered the flooding of 2013, 10-year anniversary, uh, changed forever. Is this going to happen again? If we look at, uh, I didn't find the, these data for Canada, but for the contiguous US, what we see are, by region, the trends over the last uh, 40, 50 years. And the trends are either up slightly or down slightly or static. But overall, there is, really is no trend with the warming that we've had over the last 40 years in uh, flooding, major flood events. So it takes us to our next question. We have global warming. It doesn't seem to be driving these extreme events. But is CO2 driving the warming? And I'm a geologist. I take the long view on this. So I go back into the geological record, which I want to, uh, to show here. And I'm not going back over the 600 million years of the Phanozoic time that my colleague Jan Weiser studied and showed that we had climate cyclicity and irrespective of changing CO2, it had no pattern with CO2. But uh, we'll start off here just with the last 65 million years, which is since the, uh, the meteorite impact, when the asteroid hit the Earth and, and uh, changed everything. Uh, here we have the temperature at that time, and the temperature record is, is marine from, from fossils and, and oxygen 18. Here's 25 and, and 11 degrees as a global average. And we see that the temperature has changed quite dramatically over that time, but it's been going down. CO2 is changing as well, but irrespective of temperature. So temperature is certainly not uh, correlating with CO2 at this scale. Of, of 65 million years. Sea is going up at a period when water, when air, um, ocean temperatures are going down. It's uh, changing here. It goes down to a very low period when temperatures actually start to recover a little bit. And it's getting down to points in here where many argue we're reaching the viability of life because plants need about 150 ppm. We're getting down below 200, 180 ppm. And if 150 is sort of the, the shutoff, then we're getting to dangerously low levels of CO2. And then it comes through to today, and we're at about 420. If we look at a shorter time scale in the ice ages, and here we do see some very tempting correlations between CO2 and, and temperature. And we're getting these data, of course, from the uh, ice cores in Antarctica, and these ice cores have air bubbles in them. And we did some work similar to this up on Devon Island, a much shorter time period. And uh, you know, I have a great appreciation for some of the difficulties in getting the age of air and the age of ice correct, which is a big challenge in this. But nonetheless, it's been done. So we can correlate the CO2 content of the air with the oxygen isotope temperature that we get from the ice. And that oxygen that we measure to give us temperature, the proxy temperature, uh, changes dramatically, of course, because we're going through ice ages and interglacials. So from ice ages to interglacials, we're seeing you know, ra huge temperature changes. And then the CO2 in red here is tracking it beautifully. It's a very strong correlation. So we're, they're intimately connected. But when we look more closely at this, and I'm this is the most telling, and it's uniform for all the, the, uh, the uh, 
what we call the, uh, degla the, the, glaci the deglaciation terminal, their maxima. And when we see those points where temperature from older to younger, temperature leads. It comes up first, and then CO2 comes up. Well, if we look and we see the very correlated temperature must be doing something to, or CO2 must be doing something to temperature. Quite the opposite. Temperature is driving CO2 with a lag of about 800 years. So there's no question CO2 is not driving climate. We have other forces. And on that scale, it's, it's Milankovitch cycles. And that's what's changing the uh, planetary uh, insulation. And, and we get ice ages and interglacials. We can look at the Holocene, which is a much shorter period of time, the last 12,000 years. And what we see here is that temperature has been changing. I mentioned this earlier. We had the early Holocene hypsothermal. And then it cooled off. And this is cooling off with uh, orbital uh, changes to today and then it, of course it's been going back up here we have the little ice age and then we have the recent warming but CO2 is doing quite the opposite it's following quite a different trend you might ask you know, why temperatures are dropping here is CO2 going up but CO2 is recovering because we're now exposing we've mel we're melting off during this period here we're melting off the big ice sheets and we're regaining the boreal forests in northern Canada, in Siberia, and, and CO2 is becoming more active. So can CO2, under the present scenario where perhaps temperature is not doing the work, but we're doing the work, putting CO2 in the air, is it contributing? Well, let's look at uh, what CO2 is. First of all, it's a minor greenhouse gas. It's got 420 ppm currently. Uh, and I'm showing the absorption band for radiation escaping the Earth to the top of the atmosphere. And we have windows in that where it escapes. But where we have absorption, it's dominated by one key greenhouse gas, water vapor. CO2 has very minor absorption bands. Water vapor is the main greenhouse gas. It's 25,000 or so, highly fluctuating. It condenses, forms clouds. Very confounding greenhouse gas to model because it's, it's there, then it's gone. It's creating clouds. They rain out. They're go and so modelers can't model water vapor. It has to be prescribed in their models in order to make the model warm. So they say, well, we've got this much water vapor. We're adding this much CO2. It's complicated. Here's the water cycle. 13,000 cubic kilometers of water are in the atmosphere, churning on a bi-weekly basis. And, and these exchanges are, uh, are huge. If water vapor is doing the greenhouse work, warming, then what is the role of CO2? Well, the modelers say with a little bit of CO2, we're getting a little bit of warming. And that little bit of warming is going to bring up a little bit more water vapor. And that water vapor is going to do the work. And so it's that water vapor feedback <clears throat> as a concept, which is behind the warming in all the models. So that suggests that the CO2 cycle, which is a very small cycle, is driving this huge global water cycle, which is absurd. We have no scientific evidence that CO2 is driving or amplifying uh, water vapor. It's an unproven hypothesis. And therefore, the climate models are, are incorrect. They run too hot. And we see this when we look at real data. Here we have the, the Hadley uh, data set in blue. And these are the surface measured temperatures. And we have the model temperatures. Down here, they do a pretty good job. But down here, they're learning. They're tuning to existing data. When they start projecting into the future, which was done you know, with these models around 2000, then they, they pro project into the future. And then we have to wait to see how well they did. Well, they didn't do so well. And we see this. When they go out to the year 2000, uh, 2100, uh, same process. We're, 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 here's the, uh, the measured data. And here are the models. 
They run too hot. Seawater modeled with uh, the, the same hypothesis. And again, they overestimate temperatures. So we really can't rely on these simulations. Uh, further to our question, is CO2 driving global warming? Um, we can look at CO2 on an annual basis. And uh, when we look at CO2 on an annual basis, this is the uh, exchanges that we become aware of. The atmospheric reservoir is at 760 kilotons of carbon. And the terrestrial reservoirs and the sea surface reservoirs add in to make a, a total uh, carbon reservoir of 4,000 gigatons. But that's exchanging between the atmosphere and these reservoirs, these pools of carbon. And we're exchanging roughly 210 gigatons of carbon every year. That's one quarter of the atmospheric inventory of CO2. So every four years, we've turned over the entire atmospheric pool of CO2 into our terrestrial and our marine reservoirs. So when we add our seven or so gigatons of carbon, which is not insignificant, we're, there we are, we're adding that to the atmosphere, it's getting churned into this big uh, active carbon uh, pool every four years. And we see this. Here's the Mauna Loa record for CO2. Here's the uh, Mauna Loa record, and it's really uh, fluctuating on an annual basis. And this is such a beautiful uh, observation when we look at it in particular in, uh, two, in three dimensions. Here we have uh, concentration with latitude over time. This is the rug, the CO2 rug. And what we see is the high latitudes. Here we are up here, you know, Calgary right around there, I guess. But we go up into the boreal forest. And the interannual uh, fluctuations are huge. That's that 25% which is breathing every year back and forth out of the atmosphere. The southern hemisphere, you can probably guess why there's, it's a very muted annual response. There's no land mass down there. And we've got all the land mass up in the northern hemisphere. So we do all the heavy lifting for the, you know, our boreal forests for the CO2 exchanges. And there's that cycling. So we see this cycling right there. So whatever we're putting in to the air, to the atmosphere, is getting churned into a much bigger carbon pool. And then we have to say, well, then what is controlling atmospheric CO2 concentrations? Because I thought, back when I was drinking the Kool-Aid, that it was going up with our emissions. And there's no doubt it is, because we're adding to this pool. And it's a, you know, it takes time, four years, on, uh, to, to churn in. But if we look at the interannual, and this is what Humlum did here, what he's done is looked at the concentration at this date this year, at the same date one year later, and worked that through time. And that difference is compared with the same record for temperature interannual variations. And what he finds is that the CO2 increases are changing. So we're getting changes in the concentration, the net concentration uh, up here, sorry, in green. And then and changes in temperature on an annual basis going forward. And then he compares the peaks of these. And the peaks are always offset. Temperature is leading CO2 by about a year, 11 to 12 months, on an annual basis. So again, this temperature is driving CO2. CO2 is not driving temperature, even on this decadal annual basis. Although the CO2 is going up, we're adding to that pool, it's going to come back to this exchange process where ultimately 
CO2 is going to be controlled by the, these exchange rates. So we're mixing CO2 with a four times larger, I'm just repeating myself here, uh, and the, so the concentration over time is controlled by the photosynthetic respiration and ocean solubility temperature. Temperature, on the other hand, is driven by other processes, solar activity, uh, cloudiness, and we've got great evidence for this. This is studies looking at, uh, Svensmark was a huge researcher in this, looking at changes in cloudiness with changes in cosmic rays, and I'm not going to explain all that, I really don't have time, Bob, we want to get to you, but uh, cosmic rays, nucleate clouds, the solar heliosphere attenuates those cosmic rays, thank heavens, otherwise we'd all be irradiated much more and, and have uh, genetic damage. But uh, so we, we find that the solar influence on cosmic rays influences cloudiness. Sunnier days, less cloudy skies. We have a very good correlation for that. And funnily enough, when we look at the cloudiness index, uh, I, I've just come across this paper, so he brings us up to 2020. Uh, cloudiness was higher, it seems to have, and nobody really has explained exactly why, but it's surely to do with nucleation and the types of clouds, but it drops off at about the, you know, 1998 or so, and outward long wave radiation increases into a, a sort of a, a different regime. If we look at that, it compares very nicely with the satellite data to show us where we really jumped up to this period where, starting in 1998, uh, super El Ninos, well, what drives an El Nino? Solar radiation, not greenhouse gases. It's solar radiation heating the ocean, and we get uh, these super El Ninos. So there's a lot that we're learning about what's driving climate, what is influencing climate, but surely cloud, clouds and sun are a big part of that. And these are the things that uh, climate models just cannot capture. I'll very quickly point out that the IPCC attributes about 25% of the warming that we've seen since the Little Ice Age to human activities. They say uh, over half is clearly uh, attributable, but they, they point out, oops, in their documents that the first half of the century up to 19, they say to the mid-century, but it goes up to 1980 because that's when temperatures started to rise again. All this warming, they'll admit, is natural, and they'll only say that half, well, they'll say half or more, but let's say half. That means 75% of all the warming we've experienced and documented and are worried about is natural. And Let's say CO2 is doing that other 25%. What happens when that natural component goes south on us and we head back towards the Little Age? Maybe we'd be glad that we've been adding CO2 to the atmosphere. Can we achieve net zero? Uh, so let's start off with where are we and where do we need to go? And I ask this question because notwithstanding all that we know about climate and, and CO2 as unlikely to be much of a driver, we're on this path to net zero. And I don't know who all here elected our current government, but <laughs> probably not many of you. But that's where we're headed. Unbelievable. But let's start by looking at what, where we are with electricity and, and green. And what we see is that we're already we, we, here's our, you know, the hard numbers. We're, we currently, uh, our electrical mix of 630 terawatt hours of electricity that we use in a year, uh, mostly hydro, a lot of nuclear, gas and, and coal, wind. We're doing pretty good. We're almost 82% green. Like, good for us. Why would we worry? Well, it, 
net zero is more than what we're doing with electricity right now. We have to look at our use of uh, fuels for combustion. And that's where it gets messy because we've got an awful lot. Now, this is in petajoules. I'm changing units here because these are pure energy thermal units. And um, getting the 84% of our energy demand into electrical, as is required for net zero, is the challenge. So here's our installed electrical capacity. Uh, I've changed this to gigawatts electrical of installed. This is our capacity, not our use, which is gigawatt hours. So we're, we're at about 150 gigawatt electrical for installed. And there's where we have to go to increase and accommodate net zero if we're going to stop using fossil fuels. Now, we might get some offsets with our forests. We might get some uh, little bit of sequestration uh, or, or uh, you know, carbon capture and, and storage. But mostly, it's going to go to electricity. Because we have legislation now. We've got the mid-century, long-term, low greenhouse gas development strategy. The mid-century strategy is, and it's backed up by legislation that's going to, you know, we have to do this now. So this is the law of the land. And this is their chart. Now, for such an imposing edict that we have to obey, they put in a really crappy <laughs> diagram. And I, I apologize, I couldn't find a better one anywhere on the web, but this is what comes out of the, the PDF for this. So it's really low quality, but it shows the essential. Here we are today, and here's where we have to go. And so we see that threefold increase and how we're going to do it with hydro, nuclear, wind, you know, there's no gas in there, certainly no coal. So I did some rough calculations. These aren't hard to do. You just got to get your units correct, you know. Um, but uh, this is what we would need in terms of new builds to achieve net their Ottawa's plan for uh, net zero. And these are the new wind farms we would need. It's quite a lot of wind. Hydro dams, we're going to you know, two and a half times, three times and uh, a lot more nuclear in their plan. This is an average, or I've just taken an average of their various scenarios. So let's look at what we can do with this. Big wind. Big wind in the net zero mid-century strategy. Well, we would need about 300 new wind farms on the scale of Black Ridge Spring. I, maybe some of you are familiar with that out here in Alberta. Uh, it's got 160 turbines. It's like 0.3 gigawatts. So <laughs> it's, not, uh, it's, not a, it's not a nuclear generator. It's not a, anyway, we need 10 times more turbines. That's a, a very conservative estimate. And these turbines require, it's not just a nice little planted pinion, uh, pole in the, in the field. It's got a base about 20 meters across, about 10 meters thick, or uh, sorry, about six meters thick, of concrete, which produces its own CO2 to produce, of course. Um, we would require the global production of neodymium for five years. I don't know that China and US and various European jurisdictions will be on board with us taking all the neodymium or the dysprosium we would need for the next 50 years, but you know, this is what's required. And all that has to be backed up somehow with, I don't know, Gas or coal? Won't happen. Big hydro. This is Site C. Everybody is familiar with Site C, and, and it's you know perhaps our, our current biggest hydro project in Canada. And uh, we would it's a it's a 1.1 gigawatt uh, project. Uh, Ten years in construction. It's not completed yet. They haven't started flooding. We would need about 80 new Site C dams. And the question <laughs> comes to mind, where and like what rivers are we going to dam that we can do this with? There's going to be a lot of micro hydro, perhaps, if we're going to try and achieve net zero with uh, including uh, more hydro. 
and we'd have some 8,000 square kilometers of terrain. And I'm thinking land claim issues and property rights, you know, who's going to be on board with all this and what legislation is going to, uh, you know, what the courts are going to have to deal with? What happened? Big nuclear. We'd need about 150 new reactors, 20 new power plants. Now, I'm in Ontario, and I'm familiar. I've worked at the Bruce plant. I've been to Darlington and worked around Darlington and Pickering. These are big installations, but uh, we can build them uh, at some cost. And if we go and forget big hydro and big wind and just go big nuclear, then we'd need about 400 new reactors. And that's you know, pretty much our GDP. But no one likes nuclear, so we've got a problem, Houston. <laughs> and uh, you know, we can ask the question why. And I'm going to sort of finish up on this. Uh, why don't we like nuclear? It's got such a low land use. For, this is, this is uh, watts per hectare in a, a logarithmic scale. And you can see that, and I have been, you know, here's hydro, wind, ethanol, for heaven's sakes. You know, nuclear doesn't use much land. We can put these plants uh, in a lot of different places. The qu requirement for construction material to build these, look at the, what we require for hydro and wind, huge concrete requirements. And this, again, is, is scaled to uh, the mass of materials, tons per terawatt hour. So uh, nuclear looks pretty good on the materials front, not a huge environmental footprint for that. The best safety record, again, a logarithmic scale. Coal, of course, we've had an awful lot of mining disasters. It's got a terrible record in deaths per terawatt hour. Coal, oil, you know, oil field accidents, even solar and wind. You know, people fall off their roof when they're putting up solar panels. I put up some of my cabin, and I felt at risk. I didn't fall off, but people die doing it. And it doesn't take very many deaths, because it doesn't produce much terawattage. Nuclear, by far, the safest, including Chernobyl and including the one person who died in Fukushima. And nobody died at Three Mile Island. Nobody's died in Canada from nuclear we have a tremendous safety record. So what's the problem with nuclear? Uh, perhaps it's the waste. And Greenpeace uh, produced this report with, I don't think that's nuclear waste sitting in that ha hallway, <laughs> but they would probably like you to believe that it was piling up. Uh, but we have a site. And uh, it's really, again, almost like climate. It's not about the science because uh, we found a great site, um, and it'll be social issues that decide whether it gets used or not. But this site is uh, in southern Ontario. It's very close to the Bruce Nuclear Power Generating Station. Um, we targeted a, 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 a unit in the Michigan Basin of uh, sedimentary rock under Lake Huron. And the nuclear power plant is right there. And we're at 650 meters deep. In, uh, in these geological uh, formations. We studied this for about five years some time ago. We're, we're now looking at a, a sister site right next to it. And it looks the same conditions, where the waters are literally millions of years old. This is an ancient hydrological system that is not moving anywhere. So it's ideal for nuclear waste. And it's been approved by the Canadian Nuclear Safety Commission. So we have solutions for nuclear. So overall, I'm just going to summarize my talk here, Michelle. Uh, what can we conclude? Climate change is a reality of our planet. I'm a geologist. Many of you are geologists, and many of you uh, understand geological time frames. And it's a reality we, we have to live with. We have no evidence that CO2 drives climate. It's a, it follows climate. It's, it reacts to different processes, but it doesn't drive climate. We're committed to net zero. I would say that nuclear is our only real non-emitting option. We in the field call nuclear green. We need a lot, 
of nuclear if we're going to get to uh, net zero, so good luck. <laughs> I'll just say, to summarize, that we have better ways to spend our environmental goodwill. Uh, CO2 is not a contaminant. Thanks to CO2 and temperature, we have a greener planet.